Welcome back, Santiago Amigos. This is the Old Man and the CV podcast. Today's episode is slightly longer than normal, so be patient and please listen all the way through, not just for 10 minutes while you make a cup of tea. It covers a very important issue. So let's get on with episode 16. We're delighted to be joined by Simon Nelson, QPM, for this episode. Simon recently retired from Sussex Police after serving for nearly 30 years, holding a variety of senior positions. Beating cancer and being a disabled thriver, Simon was awarded the Queen's Police Medal in the 2022 Queen's Birthday Honours List for his commitment to improving national diversity, belonging and equality in policing. After retiring from the police, Simon is now Senior Diversity and Inclusion Advisor at the College of Policing. Simon, welcome. Thanks, Andy. Good to be here. So can you tell our listeners a little bit more about what you've worked on during your career? Well, the stuff that you're allowed to tell us anyway. Yes, of course. Well, I was in policing for, for nearly 30 years and most of my roles were, were uniform roles. Um, particular, my particular interests were around specialist operations. So I was a public order commander and firearms commander at various different levels. And, and then as you touched on, sort of around about 2005, I was, I was diagnosed with cancer and had my year off that I refer to as my career break. Um, and then came, came back into it with that with some re, re, sort of new interest around around disability and um, disability issues and rights. Because of your personal experience, you just saw it in a different light, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it, I, I then had that lived experience. It, it was life going on without a stomach because it was stomach cancer um, and, and that had to be removed. And, and I'm, I'm very, very fortunate to still be around thanks to wonderful surgeon and, and staff at, at the hospital. Um, but it was with a different life, with, with new challenges. So I was going to ask you about that. So you, you came back into the, the police after your sabbatical. Um, probably at the time, the police, it's fair to say, I'm not saying Sussex police, but police in general, have had a degree of negative press about discrimination. And ironically, we are recording this episode just a few days after Stephen Lawrence Day. And there's been this negative press about discrimination, inclusivity over the years. And you're a passionate believer in fighting both of these, which obviously led to the QPM. Um, so what barriers did you meet in the police when you try to help eradicate some of this? I think, to be honest with you, so much of it is is around perceptions, um, and and the reality is that the, the the awareness around disability needs and and discrimination has has always been so low. I've I've actually referred to it as a Cinderella characteristic in the past, and when I first got into some of the conversations around disability issues and, and how people, how colleagues with disabilities could be supported better. Um, it, it took a while to get into the key national meetings and to get noticed. That's why I sort of compare it to a Cinderella characteristic because there, there were some meetings where you just weren't invited um, and then through determination and I started to get into those meetings but that didn't necessarily give you an opportunity to speak um, and there actually there was a period of time where I described myself as being like the wasp at the picnic that just kept just kept and I just kept buzzing around and you know no intention to sting but I wasn't going to go away and then eventually we reached to a point where some of those important points around disability were were being included in in discussions because they you know they're i mean the very word disability is is entirely disempowering isn't it and it, and it tends to cause people to think the focus is on what people can't do and then it shouldn't be ignored because very often for some you know in response to some very simple support 
they can achieve a great deal more but the focus is on what they can't do rather than the you know the massive other abilities that they'll have so that's interesting in the fact that there was this frustration that you kind of couldn't get your voice heard and there were the barriers for you getting into those meetings getting your voice heard and that must have been a long process which probably added to the frustration so when you're buzzing around like a wasp at a picnic how did you get them to open up the picnic hamper so you could actually get into those meetings i, th I think it is it is around persistence but it's it's also um opening up that window of different lives to individuals who are more typical. I don't use the word normal. I think the term normal is a, is a false construct. I think the whole the world is largely set up um, best for people who are most typical. Um, those, those who aren't are the ones who tend to find things really, really challenging. And it, it was talking about, you know, I mentioned about the term disability and, and the issues around that, but also you've got the other perceptions around people very often um, think of disability being largely linked to wheelchairs and blue badges, et cetera, which, which are really, really important considerations. But there's only around 50 percent of those with disabilities um, who have mobility and access challenges. And then when you draw in sort of neurodivergency and these are, these are a lot of people. Um, and I think sort of going back to the challenge with it being in policing, I think, albeit subconsciously, I think some people in policing thought that disability was incongruous to, to being a, an operational police officer. Um, and for example, in my circumstances, I have challenges in terms of having, shall we say, an inefficient digestive system. And I, I don't have any reserves. Um, it's like I've had my fuel tank taken away. Um, but I was, as I said earlier on, I was a public order commander. I was a ground commander. Um, and I used to pass the public order fitness test, even though I have, have that disability. So I think it's a broader understanding and, and also it's understanding that if you support people with disabilities to be the best that they can be, to use all of their other abilities, then they thrive rather than just exist in policing. You mentioned neurodiversity then, and we've had a couple of guests speaking about this specifically a certain percentage of the UK population is neurodiverse. Therefore, in any police force, a certain percentage will be neurodiverse. That brings different skills and different awareness to different situations. How do you get across to those committee meetings about disability, neurodiversity, or age discrimination, or whatever else it may be, that actually there are different skills and advantages that people have because of their circumstances that should be leveraged not put away because they aren't normal as you say this false construct or, or not typical did you did you have any examples of how you managed to kind of convince people to look at things in a different way well i think for the the, the first thing that was really important to me was was to listen to those who are neurodivergent rather than neurotypical i am i am neurotypical um, so it's really, really important to talk to others who, where, where that's part, part of their daily life and, and to learn from others because every day has been a school day for me when it comes to disability and neurodiversity. I, obviously, I have lived the experience of my type of disability, but there, there are a myriad. And we're, we're talking about, going back to your point about percentages, we're talking about in terms of disability and neurodiversity, we're talking about 20% the ONS has recorded, 20% of the working age population. That's a lot of people, one in 10 with, with dyslexia. And is having conversations with those others that's help, helped inform me and also for them to have confidence in me speaking on their behalf 
and very often I find a picture paints a thousand words. And what what I'd advise others to do, including anybody who's listening to the podcast, is is to search on spiky profiles. It was a really good image that I think is a really good graphic um, that shows the different respective areas of intelligence. And it demonstrates how somebody who is neurotypical will will have a pretty flat average line through all those different types of different types of intelligence. Whereas somebody who is more neurodiverse will have those spikes in higher intelligence in some areas and lower intelligence in others in terms of capabilities and, and how they interact with others, et cetera. And what works particularly well with organizations is if they have recruitment processes where they might be advertising for one particular role and somebody goes to interview and their 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 sort of relative areas of intelligence are, are clear in the interview and the interviewers flex and the organization flexes to say well actually you might not work well in this role but we know we've got this other vacancy where you'll absolutely kick it out of the park because it's really well suited to you and signpost them to that um it, it is it is just people to understand that you know, we, we all have our individual strengths and abilities and, and the risk is within organisations that you, you get people in senior positions who feel the need to recruit people who are very similar to them and sustain a, a homogenous work, workforce. Um, that doesn't work in any other business. It certainly doesn't work in policing where we're supposed to be the public we represent. You mentioned there something very simple that organisations can do um, as part of their framework to be more inclusive. What else can they do? I think the it's, it's one thing asking and it's another thing actively listening. Um, there are plenty of organisations who consult with their staff but do they actually listen? Um, and, and I think they're missing out on the trick there, particularly those with, with lived experience. Because if you take disability, for example, um, there'll be some who are aware of, of the term reasonable adjustments. I prefer the term workplace adjustments because, hey, what's reasonable? It's very rare that anybody would put in a request that would cost, for example, £50,000. Um, and some of the more expensive adjustments can be funded by access to work, the, the government scheme. Um, most, most workplace adjustments are very, very simple and might include more flexible and agile working. So that, that horrible time we went through during the pandemic did, did have some positive outcomes, which included... Um, employer attitudes towards flexible working, working from home, et cetera. And they actually discovered that if you give people that flexibility in some, in, in, in a lot of instances, they work, the individuals work harder because they're, they're trusted and it, it fits in more with, with their life, um, can be more productive and very often work longer hours. And I think that is the key. That is the key advice for any employer is, if you're not going to do it for the right reasons in terms of supporting diverse talent and supporting people according to their needs and understand the business benefits, because if you provide people with the support according to their, their individual needs, then what you get is you get, they are far more bought into the organisation and what you get, which I think most organisations fail to understand and measure is discretionary effort and if we could just bottle that discretionary effort then we'd understand how much of a difference it makes to our respective businesses but you know I have seen it so many times over the year where you have individuals who are supported as individuals and then they 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 it plays to their strengths they can be the best that they can be and they give it 110 percent That is really insightful. 
Um, what would be the one key message that you'd like the listeners of your podcast today, Simon, to take away? Um, well, I mean, in, 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 terms of, in terms of the disability side of things, I, I think it is, it is about that listening and, and also trust. There'll be occasional individuals who let us down and, and, you know, not individuals with a great deal of integrity, but the vast majority of, of people I've worked with in the past have wanted to make a difference and they have wanted to do the best that they can. Um, there are very, I think sometimes there's a perception that if, if you ask people what they need in, to, in, in order to thrive, that they will, for want of a better phrase, have the organization over and and will want everything and offer very little that that's really really borne out in my experience if if you trust individuals and and that that's a key message that i think that i've always passed on to senior leaders is is to encourage line managers when they're having those sort of review performance review meetings with individuals is to just ask that question towards the end be genuinely interested in the answer and that question is what can I do to support you to be the best be genuinely interested and ask it a second time if needs be what can I do to support you to be your best and the needs might relate to a whole host of stuff it might be somebody who has been battling with their um, symptoms relating to their disability and, and fearful of asking for a bit of support maybe somebody with care and responsibility it might be somebody of faith who who wants to go and worship at certain times. Could be stuff around parenting, caring. Yeah, you know, at the end of the day, we've whatever organisation we're in, we've got a job to do. We've got responsibilities. There's no getting away from the the business requirements, but it, it's just making the best of what are often referred to as our most important resource. Um, and that that phrase can't be just rhetoric. Um, in terms of life in general, I think my my message would be to focus on your purpose. From a personal perspective, I've always found that I've operated at my best if I followed my purpose. And I think over a period of time, you get a sense of, of kind of what you're meant to do and, and what makes your professional heart smile. Simon Nelson, QPM. Thank you very much indeed for joining the Old Man and the CV podcast today. A pleasure. Well, that's all we've got time for this week, Santiago Amigos. Thank you for listening to this extended version on a very important subject. Obviously, special thanks to our guest, Simon Nelson, QPM. Simon's details are in the episode notes. And if you'd like to reach out to him on any of the issues that he's raised, he'd be happy to connect. Simon also mentioned spiky profiles, and I have got a video for you from YouTube all about this, and the link is also in the episode notes. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to check out our sponsor's details in the episode notes, Quick Brown Fox PR. Just time for the credits. For the music intro and the eye dance, Abigail Eva Holly Blonde. This is an almost pro production for 23 Magic, copyright 2023. See you next week, Santiago Amigos. <laughs>